Amen. Thank you, Brother Dylan. You know that one day every person in this world who has lived and will live will bow to Jesus Christ. Everyone will. I just choose to bow to Him now. All right, before that time. We'll bow again then, but everyone will bow to Jesus Christ, whether they acknowledge His authority now or not. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. All right, He will reign on the throne forever and forever and forever. And so we will bow then, but I choose and hope you as well choose to bow to Him now. Not just in words. That's the easy thing to say. I love God, I believe God, but with your heart and your life. So tomorrow when you wake up, you're bowing your life to Jesus Christ and live for Jesus Christ. That's what this Christian thing is about, right? Relationship with Jesus Christ. So we live differently. We don't just come to church to come to church. If that's all there is, there's better things we could do with our time. I'll say it. Come on. You're sitting there like, if that's all there was to it, there's better things to do with our time. But we believe that God is real, Jesus is alive, and it is better to serve Him now, all right, and acknowledge Him later. And so then we want to tell everyone about that. If you have your Bibles open to Esther chapter number 3. Esther chapter number 3. Thank you again for being here this morning and for joining us online. It is a privilege, and I don't count it lightly, that you would take of your time either online or here to be here or join us that way as well. And thank you for all your faithfulness to those uh, two different avenues. And just appreciate what God is doing. I'm looking forward to next Sunday morning. We'll have Sunday school and the children's ministries as well. And so young people, you'll be in junior church next Sunday morning. And adults, you'll have your children in the nursery if you so desire. And then that as well. So that will be next Sunday morning. Of course, we have a teacher's meeting tonight after church. Esther chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 1. Just We'll read just a few verses this morning. As we look through the life of Esther, the book of Esther, who someone said, well, I don't think that book should be in the Bible because the name of God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. And they are accurate in that, if I can accusation or, an, or, or, or thought. The name of God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, but I would submit to you the hand of God is all over the book of Esther. Every single chapter we see God, Jehovah, the creator, ruler of the universe, who works everything at the council of his own will. His hand and his will is imposed upon this book, all right, and through his people. And this morning we're going to be introduced to someone who is not unfamiliar to us if we've been around Christianity, but those who are new, newly saved may not know about this particular part of the story. In Esther, chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, And after these things did Ahasuerus, that's the king, the king Ahasuerus, promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate, bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, he hearkened not unto them, and they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Lord, I thank you for your word for this time this morning. Lord, I pray you'd help our hearts to be turned towards you today. Lord, I can't begin to know all the needs that are present, Lord, all the situations that we face, but you do. Lord, it's no accident that we're at this part in, in Esther right now, and I pray that you would help me to communicate these truths clearly. Lord, help our hearts to be open to your spirit to work. Lord, touch us by your truth. Change us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray if anyone's under the sound of my voice this morning who has never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, would they please respond to you in the gospel today. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. This morning, we're introduced to a character by the name of... Haman. Now it is still held in Jewish tradition. When they uh, talk about or celebrate this day in Purim, they'll, they'll tell this story. And when they mention the name of Haman, the traditional Jews and those practicing Jews to this day will either make noise or hiss and spit when they hear his name, when his name is uttered. All right, it is a ruckus. It is a cacophony of sound, none of it pleasant, because Haman was, is so hated by the Jews and hated the Jews so much, tried to destroy all of them. 
We'll read about that a little bit later on. And to this day, when they talk about this particular part of the story, the account, when they say Haman, boy, just anger, and they, do wanna, they want to disavow his name and bring shame to even his name. Now, I can understand this in some level. They say, okay, Pastor Howell, where are you going now? I remember when we had to name our first child, all right? His name now is Johnny, John D. Howell the Fifth. All right, poor kid got stuck with a famous name without too much fame attached to it, right? You know, if you're the fifth, you got to be worth something, but he's not worth anything. <laughs> no, no. We're, lo- we're looking... <laughs> no, I, I kid, I love my son. And, and uh, we're looking to name Johnny. I'm talking to my wife. My wife is a teacher. At that time, I taught for maybe five or six years. We'd gone through some names uh, that, we would, that would be nice for a child. And I'm telling you, naming a kid for the first child, it was serious business for us. It was hard business for us. Right? There's all those things that, that ladies don't want to have someone else's name here. And, you know, this. So we, I'd say, well, what about this name? And my wife, because she was a teacher, had, unfortunately, a student with that name. She goes, oh, no, I can't name him so-and-so. Because every time I call a name, I will think of that student in my class. Well, what about this name, honey? Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. I had this student. I said, honey, you've had 28, 29, 30 students every single year, all right? That could be 150, 180 kids. And it seems like every name I have, you had a bad kid for that name. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can understand how a name would bring uh, some thoughts associated with it. I understand how you say, oh, boy, I don't want to be reminded of that particular student. Of course, all of them were blessings, of course, right? They're all blessings. But I can understand that. I can understand how, how you would say, boy, when I think of that name, I think of that problem with that person. Some of you still have that to this day. Some of you have had a coworker and you still don't like them, though you should because Jesus likes you. You hear their name mentioned and you still have, oh, right in your stomach. And when this name Haman is mentioned, he is so despised because of his position against the Jews. That to this day they will make noise, they have noisemakers and they spit and they hiss whenever his name Haman's mentioned. Well, who is this character? Who is this man? That is in opposition to God's people. This morning with Lord's help, I want to look at the opposition of our faith. Is Haman just a random character? Is Haman just a random guy? Did he get the short end of the stick? Have you ever thought that when you read the scripture? Boy, what's wrong with this guy? It seems like all the odds are stacked against him. It seems like, boy, this guy just gets picked on. Was Haman one of those guys? Or were there some things in his life, in his attitude, that we can learn? I'd submit this morning, the fact remains, the fact is true, that we will all, as Christians, face opposition. You may not realize this right now, but what the Bible says is not always socially popular. What the Bible teaches is not always socially acceptable, but the Bible is true. The Bible is right because it is the authority of God, Jehovah, the Lord. It is true. The Bible is always right. Whether you accept it and believe it and reap the blessings, or whether you ignore it and reject it and reap the consequences, the Bible is always true, and we will always proved by our lives the Bible to be right. Whether in life or in death, the Bible is always true. It is the Word of God. It is quick and powerful and sharper, the Bible says, than a two-edged sword. The Bible is accurate. It is truth. But what it teaches us is not always popular. And that's been the case since, since the Bible was written. You have to remember when Moses came down from the mountain, I read this this morning in my devotions, he's carrying two tablets of stone written by the fingers of God. That's what the Bible says. As he comes down to the camp of the Israelites, they're already worshiping a golden cow. Already contrary to what was on the two tablets of stone. The Bible has always gone against some thinking that people have. We know that the Bible talks about uh, that it's a circle, it's a circle of the earth and, and, and the circle of the heavens and, and the Bible's round. That wasn't always popular. And there are still flat earthers out there today. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. The Bible, though, is always right. And we will always prove it to be right. 
It's right when it speaks of history. For years, people would, would level a claim against it and say, listen, the Hittites did not exist, and the Bible talks about the Hittites. And then they found in an archaeological dig some evidence of the Hittites. The Bible is always right. But the Bible is not always popular in a social setting. It's not always popular in a private setting. You don't always like the Bible. Yes, I do, Pastor. I, I, I'm a Christian. No, you don't. Sometimes you don't want to be kind to your spouse. It's not popular in your flesh, is it now? Sometimes you want to have a rotten, stinking, horrible, no good, depressed attitude. And the Bible says don't. Though the Bible is not always popular, the Bible is always right. Look at this morning. What happens when we have an opposition to our faith? We see Haman ultimately an enemy of God and the people of God. I want us to realize this morning that no matter what happens, God is still on the throne. Look at this morning. Look at, first of all, the rival. I'm calling Haman the rival this morning. I see, first of all, his promotion. The Bible tells us in Esther chapter 3 that he was set above all princes. Haman was set up by King Ahasuerus to rule over everyone, and right under Ahasuerus. I will remind you that we have a couple of other Bible characters who are in similar positions. You may remember that Daniel was repeatedly set up, and he was eventually set up over all the princes. Daniel was in a position similar to Haman's. Joseph, second, right, in the whole land, Similar position. Haman was promoted and he was set above all the princes. I would contrast Haman to Daniel. Daniel carried himself wisely. Daniel sought to serve the Lord. Haman sought to serve himself. Daniel sought to serve others. Haman helped himself. Daniel wasn't trying to vie for his own position. Haman was worried about how people treated him. Haman became angry because Mordecai would not bow or give him reverence. In all of the book of Daniel, I find no, no comment whether Daniel became angry, though I do find times when other princes opposed Daniel. Remember, they tricked the king to get him caught in his prayer time. I don't see Daniel becoming like Haman is full of wrath. There's a contrast here in his promotion. He was set above the princes. And understand that sometimes... There will be people in authority who are against God and His people. If we're not careful, we will believe that all the answers to life will be in a political realm. And listen, we ought to be good citizens in this state and in this country. You need to vote. Get out there and vote. You say, can you say that, church? I can. I just can't tell you who to vote for. I can tell you who I vote for, but, but you need to get out there and vote. We need to be good citizens. We don't need to be going around destroying property. We're also Christians. We're citizens of heaven. Unfortunately, there are times that Christians have a terrible testimony in a social setting. I remember years ago, there was a Baptist church, and they would picket funerals, hold up signs, and they would protest funerals of people that they believed died in a wrong lifestyle. Well, if I ever knew one of our members doing that, you, would bet, you better believe I would come and I would find you and I would say, stop that. I'd make sure everyone knew that you're no longer part of First Baptist Church. That's not how we behave because that's not what the Bible says. All right, and while we ought to be involved in those things, politics are not the answer. Jesus is the answer. God is the answer. And we could have the best person ever in the White House, and without Jesus Christ, this world will still reject God. Why? Because our hearts are naturally wicked and desperately wicked, and they're wicked above all things. Haman was promoted, and you can't help but think, if maybe you thought, boy, what a terrible guy just got in there. Haman was not a nice man. We'll find that out later on in the book, right? Haman's not a kind man. Haman's not a fair man. But he got promoted. He was a powerful man. I see his power. He had the ear of the king. He had so much power, we'll find out, that he went to the king and said, listen, I want to do that. And the king gave him money and his ruling signet ring. 
With that ring, Haman could enact laws that would, in fact, that would affect the entire province. With that ring, he had a position, but he had power. The power was that he had the ear to the king. He'd go in there and say, King, I think God do this. The king said, Fine, here's some money, here's my ring. Sometimes it seems like the bad guys get ahead. How come he had this and Mordecai didn't? But I also see his past. I did some study on Haman, tried to figure out what was going on with this guy. This character we know as Haman. You look in verse number one, where the Bible says King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. This man becomes the arch enemy of the entire Jewish population in the land. And to this day, when they remember this, he's still the arch enemy. This man will set himself against all those who call themselves to be Jews and all those who worship Jehovah. He is dead set against them. But his background caught me a little bit. His past caught my attention. And maybe you caught this as well. But you know that we know kind of where he comes from. He said his, his father was Hamadatha and he was an Agagite. You may remember a story in Scripture that happened years, in fact, 16 generations earlier. That's how many years earlier. There was a man who was appointed by God. This man was a humble man. He was a tall man, but, but he was humble. In fact, he was called of God to do something great for God, and, and they couldn't find him. He was hiding in luggage. His name was Saul. He was anointed and became the king, the first king of Israel. The Bible tells us that when Saul was, was little in his own eyes, he was used of God. When he became great, when he became great in his own eyes, when he became full of pride, God ceased to use him and be with him. At that time, God said, I'm going to raise up someone else. And remember, now, King David was then anointed shortly thereafter. But in that time span, uh, Saul was used as an instrument of God and to do a few things for God with the, con with the nation of Israel. One of those tasks was to go to the Amalekites and to completely wipe them out. Remember that story? He didn't. If you remember, the prophet Samuel came to King Saul and, and said, as he approaches to King Saul, King Saul before Samuel says anything, he says, listen, behold, lo, I have done the command of the Lord. I've done everything God has asked me to do. And Samuel, the prophet, says, well, what means the bleeding of the sheep? What is that sheep I hear? Why do I hear sheep? Oh, 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 Saul says, I kept the, the best things around. The best of the people, the best of the sheep, the cattle, the finest clothes, the money. I kept that around because I'm going to worship God with it. Let me just pause there real quick. Does it ever kind of annoy you when people want to claim God for their own agenda? Well, well God told, I remember reading years ago, it was in a, a, a Christian news magazine. It was a Christian singer and, and she was going to divorce her husband. Right? Don't think it's right, but she said he's going to divorce it. But then she said this, God told me to. God told you to. You know, it's kind of like a, you, how do you argue with that? Well, the Lord told me that I have to do this. They kind of use it, people use it as a crutch sometimes, don't they? Oh, sure they do. Now Saul said to Samuel, the prophet, well, I'm saving this to, to worship God with. And he left the king at that point alive, and the king's name was Agag. King Agag. Haman, if you look at verse number one again, was an Agagite. He was a descendant, a direct descendant of King Agag. Sixteen generations later. Sixteen generations later, there was a man who was trying to destroy all the Jews because sixteen generations earlier, a man right here did not fully obey God. Because a man did not fully follow God. Because a man named King Saul had his own agenda with his own thoughts and his own ideas and his own plan. And he caused a slew of problems over here because he didn't choose to obey God. You see, I noticed in the past, 
that our choices matter a whole lot more than we realize. A whole lot more than we realize. What you do today can matter 150 years from now. Say, how was that, Pastor? I don't know. We're not smart enough to know that, are we? King Saul wasn't. You're not, I'm not, but God is. That's why he has a plan for us. That's why he calls us in obedience to worship him and to follow him and to obey him. What you do today really matters for God. What you choose today really matters to God and maybe to a whole nation. You realize that because of King Saul's choice, this entire nation was affected by it? People who knew of Saul but never met Saul. People who were in captivity. Beyond that, beyond that, other people in this whole story, when they actually went out, there was enemies and the Jews were fighting, and, and, and people lost their lives. The whole thing happened. King Saul's choice back here. 16 generations earlier. I guarantee he never knew that when he went out to battle that day. You see, disobedience has dire consequences. And remember this, do-it-yourself mentality doesn't ever benefit you in God's economy. You see, Saul had a do-it-yourself mentality. I've got God's plan, but I've got a better way to do it. And I can do it myself. We live in a do-it-yourself society, do we not? Boy, you can find tools and help and videos to do just about anything that, that, that you can look at. You can figure out how to change a small part in a car, how to rebuild something at your house, rebuild a tool set, whatever it may be, you can find do it yourself. You can make any kind of recipe you want. There's a recipe online for it. You can do it yourself. And there are a whole bunch out there of do-it-yourself failures on every level. There's sometimes there are cooking do-it-yourself failures. Maybe you've seen those sometimes where they say, this is what I tried, well, this is what was on Pinterest, and this is what actually happened, and they don't look the same. You know, nailed it, look at that. There are do-it-yourself uh, uh, construction fails. You're like, wow, look at that. That, that guy did all by himself. Do-it-yourself uh, sewing fails, everything. And for us men, duct tape solves everything. You understand that do-it-yourself mentality never benefits you in God's economy. In God's economy, do-it-yourself is the ultimate failure. Do-it-yourself, you'll fall flat on your face. Do-it-yourself means that you'll create problems that you may not realize. And Haman was around because years earlier a man did it himself. Don't forget that what you do today has consequences for eternity. When you leave today, what you choose to do has consequences far beyond what you and I can see. It's a big deal to follow God. It's a big deal to say, I believe God, and not only with lip service, with my life. See, I see the rival. But then I see the refusal. Haman gets his promotion. And Mordecai doesn't bow down. And I've got to be honest, that really, that really stumped me. That stumps me. Why? I, got, I was trying to figure out, why, why didn't Mordecai bow down and, in, in reverence to Haman? There is not a Jewish law that a, that a Jew could not bow to a potentate, to a king. It's, it's nowhere in Scripture. It's not any Jewish law. They could bow to a king. It was acceptable. It was fine. Many accounts of that happening, in fact, to the contrary. It was not a sin just to, just to give reverence to a ruling king. Not a sin. Someone posturized, well, maybe it was because Mordecai was bitter that he didn't get promoted and Haman did. Because remember, right before this, Mordecai had rescued the king. It didn't quite line up with scripture, though you find that at the end of chapter 2 where Morde Mordecai saves the life of the king and he doesn't get any recognition. But see, Mordecai wasn't supposed to rule. He wasn't a prince. He wasn't in the same, the, the, the same caste as that. It wasn't an issue at all. And it really stumped me. Now, someone theorized, they, they said, well, one scholar said, well, it was because Haman had an idol on his garments. Now, he might have. It's very possible. But I don't see that in Scripture, do you? I don't see that. Now, it's possible, but I don't see that. And so I'm trying to figure out why didn't Mordecai bow? This is kind of crucial to the rest of the account, is it not? It was really, it, honestly, it was really perplexing me why, and, and sometimes scripture is silent. 
Sometimes the Bible does not tell us, and I'm okay with that. But sometimes we have to dig a little bit and work a little bit as a pastor. That's what I try to do. And I believe that the key is here. You'll see it in two places here. If you look with me in chapter number uh, three of Esther, look in verse number two, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. You see in that verse, there's those two words, bow and reverence, twice in that verse, right? You see that? Look in, in verse number five, when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. You see that? Those two words together. But you understand that this, this refusal, it was unmistakable. All right, that, that it was no, it was no, uh, there was no misconception about what Mordecai was doing. He was not going to bow down. In fact, as I read this, Haman walks past, people are bowing down, and, and Mordecai, I think, stands up straighter. I think it was the opposite way. It was obvious because everyone else says, hey, Mordecai, what are you doing? It was unmistakable. It was undeniable. Those two words, bow and reverence, and this is as I begin to study and find out that in Scripture, those words are often used individually. Bow will be used multiple times, and reverence. They'll be used in worship to God. They'll be used sometimes reverence as Sarah did to Abraham, her husband. But when they're used in combination, bow and reverence in Scripture together, when they're used together, you only find it here in reference to Haman or in worship to God. When they're used together in Scripture, whether besides the part right here, they're used in reference to Jehovah. Bow and reverence. In fact, what the Scripture's saying is when they were bowing Haman, it was not just a reverence to him, it was an act of worship. Let me read the Scripture to you out of 2 Chronicles when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped. It's that combination. Bow and reverence here. Here it says worship. 2 Chronicles 29, verse 29. Hezekiah bowed and worshipped. In Psalm 22, 29, where it talks about um, how we bow and reverence God, saying two words together. In fact, in Psalm 22, it begins with this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In fact, many scholars believe that Jesus Christ on the cross quoted the entire 22nd Psalm. Those same words, bow and reverence. You see, I believe that Mordecai did not bow down, not because he wasn't allowed to, but because there is only one God to worship, and his name is Jehovah. That's why he didn't. It was not just, oh, who is this man who I don't like, or who perhaps he's, a, he's an Amalekite. It's because the act of what they were doing was an act of worship, a spiritual act. And Mordecai I said, you know what? I have to draw the line there. As for me and my house, like Joshua, will serve the Lord. I will worship only the Lord Jehovah. I cannot bow and worship you. I will choose to serve God today. And though I may render to Caesar what is due to him, and I will obey them that have the rule over me, I will only worship Jehovah. Listen, Christian, friend, you could only worship one God. You can't worship two gods. Franklin Roosevelt was a churchgoer. It was said that on one gloomy Sunday morning during the World War, he walked three miles in order to attend a worship service. One of his neighbors commented after they noticed this and said, well, I can worship in the fields or anywhere else. And yes, replied Mr. Roosevelt, but no one will ever suspect you of it. Mordecai stood straight up. He said, just in case you're wondering, Mr. Haman, I can't worship you. I can follow the, the, some of the laws of this land. They don't contradict with what God says, but I can't worship you. I can only worship God, Jehovah. I can only worship the Lord, the great I am. So with that, what do we do when there's opposition to our faith? When there's people in power who can't stand us, I'll give you just three thoughts and we'll be done this morning. First thought is this. Don't be surprised when God's people come under attack. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if in America God's people come under attack. Don't be surprised. We've seen it around the world. But beyond that, Jesus said, 
if the world hates you, don't be surprised. They hated me first. Don't be surprised when God's people come under attack. What? I can't believe they would say that. I can't believe they would do that. I can't believe. Of course. Don't be surprised when God's people come under attack. We follow the Bible. We follow God's direction. Recently, there's a few Supreme Court cases that came down. Some in direct opposition to churches. Don't be surprised when God's people come under attack. In the case you're wondering where I stand, the answer is not in the Supreme Court. It's not. The answer is in Jesus Christ. Don't be surprised. Uh, uh, the, the views we hold from God's Word are not going to become magically more popular all right, without Jesus Christ and His transforming power. So don't be surprised all right, when God's people come under attack. Don't be surprised when how you view God and how you view the world through the lens of God's Word is just different. Don't be surprised when God's people come under attack. They'll say things like, well, you know what? In the history of our nation, and it's very true, our nation was founded upon truths of God's Word. But because we have sinful people among us, we're only going one direction, right? And it's not closer to God, it's away from God. So don't be surprised when God's people come under attack. Remember this, you can only worship one God, so worship the true God. You can't worship two masters. Jesus said that. No man can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other. But worshiping God does not mean I don't submit to other authorities. I worship God, yet I want to see my wife. So if she asks me to pick up some groceries, I do that. Right? You worship God, that doesn't mean, well, you can't tell me what kind of time to come to work. I worship God. No, we always have to follow other authorities, but it never contradicts our worship to God. Little boy asked his mother what was the highest number she ever counted to. The mother didn't know, so she asked him if he remembered the highest number he counted to, and he said, yes, 5,372. His mother was puzzled and asked why he stopped at that particular number. The boy responded, well, church was over then, so I stopped counting. 60% of unchurched adults say they worship God during a typical month, but not via a church service. You can only worship one God. So worship the true God. Can you worship God in the field? Absolutely. You can worship God in your house, but God has set up this thing called church. And thank you for those who have been here and joined us online. Worship God where He wants to. The little story goes, one Sunday morning, Satan happened to be standing outside a large Baptist church. Inside, the people were singing and praying and listening to a sermon. Someone passed by and noticed Satan standing outside the steps of the church. The pastor, the pastor buyer asked Satan if it bothered him that people were at church. He said no with a demonic laugh. No, it doesn't bother me in the least. They get that way on Sunday, but it'll be all right come Monday morning. It's just a little habit they've acquired. Unfortunately, for a lot of Christians, it's just a little habit it's acquired. If you're going to worship God, worship God. You can only worship one God, so worship the true God. And that doesn't mean just here at church. You worship Him tomorrow morning when you wake up. Worship Him when you're at, on your lunch break. Worship Him when you come home at night. Worship Him Tuesday morning. They that worship the Father must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Follow God. Worship the true God. And lastly, don't forget that God can work through your enemies. Oh, we're going to see an amazing ending to this story. Haman, he was powerful. Haman, he was nasty. Haman, he was popular for a little while, but God is more powerful. God is bigger than any enemy you may have. There was a fellow who applied to work at a place to chop down trees. A little fellow, they said. Short little guy. They said, okay, you got to drive. We'll give you a little test on this job. So they brought him to some big trees, the redwood trees. They said, well, chop that one down. Sure enough, took the axe and chopped it down. So they said, it must be a fluke. They said, here's another redwood. Chop that one down. He chopped that in a little axe. He said, man, you're amazing. Where did you learn to cut down trees like this? He said, oh, in the Sahara forest. They said, the Sahara forest, isn't, don't you mean the Sahara desert? He said, oh, is that what they call it now? 
And God can take that forest and make it a desert, can he? God can take that situation that looks impossible. And God is in the impossible business. So worship him. You have problems in your life? Worship God. You have an enemy in your life? Worship the true Jehovah. You have opposition at work, at home, other places? Worship God. He's worthy of our worship. Lord, I thank you for this truth. Lord, I pray you touch our hearts. Lord, that we would not just be worshipers of you in, in lip service, but with our heart. Lord, we need you. Lord, we're going to face, and we already face opposition, and you're the only answer to it. Lord, there is no other answer. You're here this morning, my friend, and I wonder if perhaps you have opposition in your life. Or maybe God touched your heart this morning and you claim to worship God, but to be honest, between you and God, you don't really worship God. I wonder who would say this morning, Pastor Howell, as you were speaking, God spoke to me. God touched my heart. Maybe something I said, maybe something I didn't. Would you say, Pastor Howell, would you pray for me? God spoke to me this morning. I need to do business with God. Would you pray for me with an uplifted hand? Amen, I see that. Amen. 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 Who else? Pray for me. What if you're this morning and you say, you know, Pastor, as you spoke, I don't know that I, I've ever trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'd love to you just slip your hand up. I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. I'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'm not sure I'm, I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for them? Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you've seen the hearts. Lord, you know what our needs are. Lord, help us not to just have lip service of worship to you, to worship in truth and spare spirit. Lord, help these who have raised a hand. They would respond to you like they ought to. Lord, I pray there's anyone here or online who's never trusted you as their Savior, they would trust you today in Jesus' name. Amen. As you stand to our feet, the piano's already playing. The altar's open. Can you do business with God? You do that now.